Hi everybody, thanks for joining us for another edition of Hold My Dream, where we navigate the news and politics with a chaser of civility. I'm your host, Jen, inviting you to grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and imagine with us how to create a new American identity together. Welcome to this week's Hold My Drink and Counterweight podcast with my co-host David Bernstein. Today we have Lee Jessam, the dead, dread pirate Lee. <laughs> He's a professor of social psychology at Rutgers University and a friend of both of ours. So Lee, we've got some, some things to discuss with you today, but first, I see you brought something to drink to the table. What was that? This is just your 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 basic uh, iced. Actually, this is half lemonade, uh, half iced tea. So it's an it's a bottled commercial Arnold Palmer. Arnold and, and Palmer. It's, it's quite good. Yes. Ooh, David, did you bring something? I did. I did another scotch on the rocks. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. I'm I'm doing. Uh, you've seen this once before. It's a michelada. Lee, what is you know, a michelada? Yeah. I don't even know what that is. It's a southern thing. It's it, it's going to sound gross, but it's not. It is tomato juice and beer. Oh. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we were in Germany, we learned about lemonade and beer, which sounds mm. bizarre and is really good. Really? And sometimes in the winter, they drink it hot, and that's really good. Oh, that sounds yeah. really good. Yeah. Okay, I'm now I'm going to... that down. Seriously. I'm going to try that and, yeah. and heat it up. Yeah. yeah, it sounded really weird. And then we tried it and it's like, oh, yeah, this is good. I can see why they do it. Ooh, okay. I've got a new drink choice. All right. <laughs> um, so, so Lee, I, 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 I'm going to start with the first, first question for you. You and I did a um, live stream called American Authoritarianism. Um, then in there, here and now, and we compared uh, compared it with, China, we compared it with Russia, we compared it with Argentinian fascism. You were the brainchild behind a lot of that, and you gave the little introduction, but I'd love for you to just kind of give a recap of where you think American illiberalism is and where we're going. Uh, what, well, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm very worried. I mean, I think it's very bad on both the right you know, you have both the extreme left and the extreme right highly energized. Um, and, and I, I, you know, maybe it's always been like this to some extent. I mean, if you go into American history, there have been violent uprisings and rebellions, like from the get go, uh, you know, like the whiskey rebellion and all this sort of stuff. So, I mean, the country has this sort of ugly history of sort of violent radicalism. And so maybe it's nothing new, but we have really hadn't seen anything like this since, you know, since the more violent protests of the 60s and 70s. You know, the Vietnam, the Vietnam War produced this whole radical movement and there were building bombings and, you know, that went on for like a decade and stuff. It was very bad. And then it kind of calmed down. So most of my adult life, like the country has functioned like a more or less civil political society. People might have disliked each other or didn't dis despise certain policies or hated certain politicians or whatever. Uh, but this, this endorsement of illiberalism, of you know, overturning elections, uh, of, of violent protest as necessary because the institutions are, you know, th that this is new. And, you know, the, the violence is built on um, on a foundation of sort of extremist ideology and and despising one's opponents. And you know there hasn't been since the um, Capitol riot, there hasn't been a lot of violent political protest. So in that sense, things may have seem like they may be calming down. I, I just don't see any calming down of the extremism on either the left or the right. And that's the, you know, it's like a powder keg potentially waiting to blow. I'm not exactly predicting that it's going to, I'm not good. I, I don't know. I'm not usually good at predicting the future. I think it's a very, and I, and I don't have enough information to say, oh yes, by sometimes over the summer, you're going to see a, a, another round of violent political protest. I'm not saying that. I don't know that, but I just don't think the 
the underlying support for that on either side has diminished at all. So I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the the frame kind of understates what what I do see as the you know, sort of intellectual and institutional support for essentially liberal democratic values and processes. I, I see that as frayed and continuing to fray. Um, and, and therefore those protection, protecting us against violence, violent political protest on the left and the right, I just see that as having, having been weakened. But, so I, I think I'll, I'll st- I can say more, but that, that, I'll stop there. Right. So you're an academic. You're the chair of the psychology department at Rutgers. Um, you're at, in the area that's most likely to face illiberalism on the left, uh, cancellation even. Have you personally ever faced cancellation for your very public views? Have you had students explicitly attack you in class and claim that you are beyond the pale? How have you navigated that? What's been oh, like? Oh, yeah. I, 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 you know, I've taken to describing and I've been subject to two and two half cancellation attacks, all of which fail. Um, uh, so um, I've never been attacked in class, but I've actually absolutely been attacked by graduate students, um, the graduate students in the psychology department. Um, and the uh, and I've been attacked online. You know, I once online, um, uh, uh, a person I didn't know dismissed someone I did know as white women, white women. So the woman I knew was this white woman who was basically saying women have it pretty good in the United States. And this, this I, I don't know, I, I think in some Irish or UK school, you know, d- d- declares that the person saying women have it pretty good as white women, white womening. So I say that's a racist slur. And that brought all hell down on me, including people contacting Rutgers to fire me. Oh, wow. So, so wow. and that, inspired my deans to investigate my social media feed. And fortunately, my deans were reasonably sane and reasonable people. And they said, well, there's nothing, you know, I mean, I was, they were calling for my head because I'm a racist, I'm a danger, you know, I'm a danger to, you know, to, to, to junior, junior faculty of color. I mean, it was just, you know, that, that, that I'm threatening people. I mean, it was just like, you know, it's exactly what you would expect from an online outrage mob. And of course, you know, my administrators don't know what to make of it. Like maybe I was doing, you know, maybe I was making death threats to somebody in Ireland or something, you know, whatever, who knows, right? I and mean, the whole thing is when you step back, even like three inches, it was all absurd. But, you know, in the heat of it, it's not really obvious what's true. So they did this investigation. And then with one of my deans, you know, I had a one-on-one and, and he made two points. He said, look, you know, you, you can do whatever you want online, but as department chair, um, you're, you know, you're not, your position as chair is not protected. You know, your position is protected, but, you know, I, do you really want both you personally and Rutgers embroiled in this sort of ridiculousness? And, you know, it was a little bit of a threat, but, uh, but, he, but underneath the threat, I concluded he was actually right, that I didn't, who needed this? This was like, there was no point to this. And so, um, uh, uh, so I did back off of some of my more you know, aggressive takes on certain people. Um, although I suspect I remain sufficiently out there that lots of people would say they haven't seen any like reduction in how, you know, kind of um, forward I am on, on, on some of this, but, but they would be wrong. I mean, I have like not, saw, I mean, this was, this person turned out to be a postdoc and, you know, was, em- in my opinion, emblematic of everything that is wrong with academia. Right, right. You know, so, I mean, the, the phrase white women, white women is a racist epithet. Right, I, right. I know and it's, it's like the Karen thing. Yeah. It's like yeah. Karen. Karen is just it's another way of- Because like hypothetically, you know, anybody could be a Karen, right? You could have a Karen from Costa Rica, right? You could have a Karen from Nigeria, hypothetically, right? But white women, white women is explicitly racist. It's explicitly right. racist. 
So, and, so, and that this is okay. This is, you know, I actually just gave a talk at the University of, uh, at, at, at San Diego, UCSD, on the uh, radicalization of academia. And one of my hypotheses that helped frame the talk was that in academia, um, you can uh, make almost any claim, I'm now reading from the talk, you can make almost any claim, no matter how virulent, bizarre, or unjustified, no matter how much it constitutes incitement to group hatred, if you frame it as some form of social justice. And mm -hmm. then I had a slew of examples, not, not including my cancellation attacks. Really? But the resolution you always have, was that, you always have that, a slew of examples, you know, and uh, yeah, I know this yeah. because uh, more than a, a, a few times on Twitter, I've gotten into sort of exchanges with people and then Lee will come in, but with these very in-depth charts and studies and everything. And I'm like, yeah. oh, my God, thank God for him. And he's, um, <laughs> and, you know, oh, so, so, uh, right, OK, so, so this, is, I got, this is tangential. So then <laughs> this is how discourse goes in academia. Then I get denounced. For, for piling on, right? So somebody makes some claim. The claim is ridiculous. Like you could say, okay, well, that's not really true. Well, you know, you're, this is just your confirmation bias. No, here's five studies and three examples, you know, which will go through maybe, you know, five or six tweets. Oh, piling on, who, who wants to deal with you? Right. So you can't have it both ways. You can't, you cannot say, I mean, you can, and you'll see it all the time, but, you know, it, it, people are watching. Let's put, let me put it this way. And I think it's worth, having people watch. Someone says, you know, that's a ridiculous claim. There's no justification. Here's overwhelming evidence that it is not a ridiculous claim. And then to get denounced for providing too much information. Right. But like, right. that's beautiful. People that's know hilarious. what's going on with that. Right. So you're you're a well-established academic and um and you're gonna have standing and it's gonna be harder to sort of cancel you. But let's say you're this is a real world example from the last couple of days. Um, a, an academic who's got, recently got a PhD, who probably agrees with you on 90% of the issues, teaches a class, um, a couple of students, they talk about race and racism. Um, the, a couple of students get angry that she's not, um, she's not towing the line. I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritty because she's actually quite worried that they're going to, they're going to, be able to tell that it, who it is from me, um, and so um, um, so she so she um, is now they they challenge her in a very very direct way, and they're gonna probably reach out to her department chair, and the department chair of course probably agrees with these two students that she should be towing the line. What do you tell a young academic like that who's facing such an onslaught? Well, okay, so so. Uh, first, let me uh, 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 tell, just tell you, you're welcome to give her my contact information, and she is welcome to contact me, and I'm happy to talk to her. Um, so, uh, so it's funny that you ask this. Obviously, I don't know this particular situation, but because I'm out there in the way I am, you know, the blog series and the Twitter especially, um, and, and, and podcasts, people kind of know what I represent. And so... I am regularly contacted by people like this. There was mm -hmm. a period of about a year where I was running like one contact like this a week. And it's now maybe two or three, it's calmed down a little bit. And th these are from graduate students who are very uncomfortable in their departments. They are from junior faculty who are very uncomfortable in their departments. They are probably disproportionately um, psychologists because that's who knows me the best. Uh, but they are from all over the place. I've had people in music departments. And actually, uh, I don't remember how it started, but we, and so I had a group that was a sort of ongoing discussion group about radicalization. Um, so so it's, it was really, this group invited Dorian Abbott when he mm -hmm. was first subject to a cancellation attack within his own department. Um, and we invited him in and we kind of, you know, in, in a constructive way, read him the riot act. And by that, what I mean is a, a normal person, a typical you know, person, whether in academia or not, who's just going about their lives, thinks they're, you know, they just want to do their work and do their job and kind of like, you know, just get through life, which is hard enough, gets subject to one of these, you know, bizarre, 
you know, cancellation type attacks where people are making vile accusations. You know, there might be like some hint or sliver of truth in it somewhere, but they're mostly kind of Orwellian style distortions designed to impugn the person and publicly shame them. A, a regular everyday walking around person doesn't know what hits them. And a very common response initially in academia is to want to have a discussion and address the ideas and the claims with one's critics. The problem is that you know, they're not looking for a discussion. They're, they're looking to get you punished. They are seeking to, you know, to inflict some sort of harm on you, getting fired or removed from teaching or, or, or simply socially ostracized. And so, so they're not looking for a discussion. That's, and in fact, they will use anything you say against you. But I, you know, and I've seen it happen, this happen in my white women and white women thing. Before it turned into a, a drinking my, inter, my interlocutor, the main one, asked me what I wanted. So I told her I wanted an apology. Then, you know, then she kind of tweeted out that I was this like evil racist person and brought all sorts of hell. Yeah, you know, she asked me what I wanted, like make my, and I answered, and make my head explode. That, that justifies the cancellation attack. It's like, and she might have said, well, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think an apology is appropriate. I think what I, that might have happened, but that is not what happened. So anyway, with, Dor with Dorian, we kind of let him riot. These people are not, you don't want to try and engage these people. Uh, what you want to do is protect yourself. Um, and, and here are the things you can do to protect yourself. One is not engage because they will use anything you say against you. And the other is find allies. And we actually put him in touch with one of the editors at Quillette, who then quickly, the Quillette editor organized a petition. It was really a counter petition because the cancel mob at Chicago had organized a petition with, I don't know, 150 signatures denouncing uh, Abbott, Dorian Abbott. Um, so within like a week, Quillette had garnered 8,000 signatures and sent it to the University of Chicago. A day or two after they sent that petition, the University of Chicago president issued this sort of ringing endorsement of academic freedom and everything calmed down. So, I, you know, David was asking me, what advice would I get? You know, each situation is slightly different, but, but the Dorian is sort of the, the prototype of, of, the, of that advice. Don't engage your, you know, just, they're gonna use it, right? Find allies and, and take your time because if you react to the immediate situation, you're likely to get yourself in more trouble and with allies, then respond. So, okay, I, 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 and I, I agree with that. Like I actually am not on social media except for to sometimes follow you or something funny that you're talking about, right? Um, but is there ever, we're so divided Things are so polarized. Obviously, social media is not a place really for a true engagement. Yeah. But at some point, to address what your your fears are, that you started out in this uh, in this podcast, I mentioned your fears of the illiberalism. We've got to engage in a way where we don't see the person as the other anymore. You know, I mean, that's part of the problem is we're othering yeah. other people. Yeah. How is that even possible? Like, what would what? I mean, in order to get past this, do we all just need to like blow up Twitter and like get back into like bowling clubs and start bowling together? Or <laughs> I mean, like, I love uh, yes, yes. So, so okay, that was not really where I would have gone, but I think your your intuition there is pretty good. So, <laughs> when people do things together, they kind of more readily come to realize that you know people can hold some really different worldviews and values and still be decent people, like really decent people. Be the kind of person you might go to if you know you had an, an emergency at home or something like that. So actually, the bowling leagues or, or the equivalent of that, yeah. you know, is probably a good idea. Um, you know, my version of that is well, okay. So so actually, let me talk about a study that just came out. Um, it's really a series of of, of studies um, showing that uh, people. Showing this dynamic that you just described, that, mm -hmm. that you have, what, well, there, there's a, a, not just these studies, there, there's a well, you know, as you know, I'm very skeptical of a lot of social science, but I think this stuff has been done very well, so I believe this stuff. There's a lot of stuff showing that people's actual beliefs and policy preferences 
are not all that far apart, even across mm -hmm, partisan mm -hmm. divides. Um, but what is sort of supercharging the divisiveness is that they hate each other. They really hate each other. They, each side uses the other side not merely as disagreeing or but but as right. as, as as evil as, evil. as, as yeah. viscerally evil. Right. Um, and so and, and you know, and then once that happens, everything else is logical, right? Because if they are if they are really evil, they are they are seeking to dominate and destroy everything of value in the well. Then of course you would oppose them. Like how could you not oppose such an evil movement, right? Right. So the, the, there's a psychological logic. Okay. So so that is true. That the, the the actual like policy and even belief differences are not as large as the affective differences. People hate each other, even though the you know you it, I can imagine it's it, it is actually probably more easy. It, more, it, it could be more easily done to bridge the belief differences than the affective differences. But the affect uh, differences are driving a lot of this. So I'm, I don't know what to do about that. So that's why bowling leagues are good, right? So you think if you don't hate them so much, right? So that's a good one. In, in, but this recent paper that just came out, um, uh, one of its unique findings, so it repeated, that's called affective polarization. After that is, it's the emotions that are supercharging the divisiveness, as opposed to the beliefs. Um, so they replicated the affective polarization effect. But in addition, what they found is that people are very reluctant to criticize or denounce the extremists on their own side. And it's not completely clear where, where that reluctance or fear is coming from, there are, but there are two plausible contenders. The extremists are often the activists, and they're often highly organized and very active. And so you're at risk of personally being like ostracized from the side that you actually kind of intellectually or ideologically side with. And that would be very uncomfortable to be, you know, kind of ostracized from your own side. But so that's one possible explanation. And the other is that people are very reluctant to give credence to the other side. So if you reject the extremists on your own side, there's a risk of it, you know, energizing or justifying or vindicating or being perceived as vindicating, you know, the evil other side. And that people don't want to do that either. But what that dynamic ends up doing is ceding the public discourse to the extremists on both sides. And so when, when like a moderate Democrat is listening to sort of right wing discourse, it is the extreme stop the steal pedophile QAnon discourse because people on the right are reluctant to say, well, you know, Trump probably shouldn't have done that. And it's the same thing on the right. When the when people on the right are you know, kind of paying attention to sort of left-wing discourse, it's like there's, you know, 500,000 genders, uh, you know, and, and DEI should be instituted everywhere. And, you know, uh, and, and so, and they hear this and what they hear is, oh my God, these people are crazy. So, I have a, because they, you know the, the public discourse has been not completely obviously, but has been largely ceded to the extremists and the people who are not as radical and not extreme. There are some, and there are some very um, prominent voices like John McWhorter is one of my favorites. You know, he's a New York Times columnist. It's not like he doesn't have a, a, a voice. He is constantly pushing back against left extremism. But he's an unusual. There's not. I mean, Freddie DeBoer is another good one. Very left. Socialist, uh, you know, um, um, uh, you know, policy wise, about as far left as you can get, but con not con regularly writing about the um, the excesses of woke illiberalism. But but they're unusual. That you know, they are unusual. And in fact, it's I have a question for you about people this. People who have been subject to these kind of cancellation attacks, who are you know, say you know, no, this this will not stand. I am going to attempt to stand a thwart. The extremists on my own side, but that mm -hmm. it's that those are the exceptions. Very few people are willing to do that. Right. So I have I have a little thought experiment, okay, that I, I very interested in getting your take on. That goes into sort of this idea of of um, affective polarization and whether or not there's actually an ability of people to come together. So let's say you were to take five moderately woke educators or academics who have expertise in social studies or history or whatever. And then you took five moderately traditional 
academics who would teach like a traditionalist American perspective on, on its own origin story and the like. And you put, you put them in a room for a week and you said, we want you to try to come up with uh, two things. Let's say, first of all, an origin story of America that would allow for, you know, some, uh, some leeway for both of you and, um, and, a, and a way of teaching about systemic racism. Um, that um, and you know, and I, you'd, one would think that the traditionalists would say, "Well, I don't take systemic racism at face value. I think it's something you question." And the moderately woke people would say that that it's already been decided. How would what would ha would, would would they be able? In the, um, to me, if the, if the answer is no to that to that thought experiment, if that's not doable, then we're really in trouble. That means that that we won't be able to fashion a common national narrative and at least any time in the near future? Uh, so I'm going to answer a smaller version of that because I, you know, national narratives, you know, I, I don't know how to do that. Um, but what I do know how to do is work with people from across ideological and partisan divides because I do that all the time, actually. So um, I am, a, a lot of my um, scholarship now is um, through a collaboration with the Network Contagion Research Institute. Um, they're housed at both Princeton and Rutgers, um, and they do a lot of work on radicalization, both radicalization on the right and left. Um, and they are, are this is maybe uh, it's way up there with my favorite collaborations in my entire career because we're doing very political and politicized stuff, uh, but it's one of the few places in academia that you can do that work with people um, from, uh, you know, who, who belong to different, who strongly identify with different parties and have different ideologies and all this sort of stuff. So um, there are very few non, you know, there are very few people right of the, a mainstream Democrat in academia. There's very, very few. I mean, there's so few that if I ran the numbers, that, well, there's so few that even conservatives underestimate uh, how, how extreme the skew is. Um, and it, it sounds like, you know, delusional propaganda you'd hear on Breitbart or Fox or something like that. Um, but it's actually true. So, you know, like the proportion of Democrats to Republicans, especially at top universities, especially in the social sciences, is like 90, 90 to 99%, you know, and that's just Democrats to, you know, right, this is this hardly anybody, and actually one of my favorite analyses that the people who have studied with me, is one, Mitch Langbert has done a lot of this, he's at one of the CUNY schools, um, uh, he's looked at, so that's like party identification, and that's like public records in a lot of places, so you can get that, uh, but he's also looked at party donations, and among these samples of 50 elite colleges, um, people whose party registration is Republican are almost five times more likely to donate to Democrats. So, so even party registration underestimates the left skew of academia. That's my only point. Now, let's say it's, you, I'm not making the case that, you know, well, you know, it's better to be a Republican. So they, you, Academia means more Republicans, but the skew is it means that if you want to work across a partisan divide in academia, it's almost impossible because there is almost nobody from the other side. And so the this work with the NCRI, many of the potential people that you can work with are actually not academics. They're people with research skills or, or other kinds of skills and public intellectuals sometimes. Um, uh, uh, and and are brought together to work on these teams on you know whether it's on right wing militias and, and sort of how they organize online or the sort of the radical groups that instigated a lot of the violent protests in places like Portland and Seattle you know and it's really great to do this with people I and mean, some people are really pretty far left and they're at least moderate pretty soft, strongly identified Republicans. I don't think I would describe, describe anyone as far right. I don't think it's like a near fascist on the, on the thing. Um, uh, but you get very different perspectives. But there's a great article by Richard Hanania. So I, I think his personal politics are somewhat right of center. 
He runs the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology out of Columbia. Um, and you know, he has a substack and a blog site, and his center produces reports. So I forget exactly where this is located. But in one of his pieces, he argues that really political. So I, I have been very prominent in arguing that academia needs more political diversity. And I, I think I, I stand by that. I think it does. But he made some really good counterpoints in this essay that it's not really about political diversity. It's about whether you, you know, uh, uh, your, your scholarship and your analysis, whether it's like literally data analysis or logical analysis, hinges primarily on rules of logic and, and statistical inference and whether your beliefs are changeable by data. Like if, if you have all that, he, say, he, he continues, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't really care what your political ideology is. Um, so that's like a really good point. I, I think that's actually a really, really good point. And so returning to your point, Jennifer, how do you cross that? That is a way to cross that. Now, the, the person you're working with has to have these assumptions. And you know, often the radicals on each side do not share those assumptions. So if you don't share those assumptions, my answer is I don't know what the hell you do. But if you have people who do share those assumptions, it's at least hypothetically possible to actually work with them on, on, on anything, work together to sort of solve some problems. So, but you have to start with those shared assumptions. Mm -hmm. yeah, logic uh, matters, data matters, you know, yeah. Yeah, it seems to me one of the biggest challenges we face is what some have called epistemic closure. That, that the idea that there are certain ideas that have been worked out the 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 case for systemic racism has been one of them that's frequently asserted that we know that systemic racism exists they don't even not only don't don't they have to defend it but they don't even have to actually be clear on what it is so right. uh, when people will talk about systemic racism i don't right. know do they mean that it's that uh, sort of white dominated culture writ large? Do they mean um, a particular institution that might have racism, which I might even agree with? Um, do they mean that, you know, right. And, and, and they don't have to actually say it. They just have to say systemic racism is the reason why there's disparity and end of discussion. And I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what to do with that. Um, they want to assert that that's as axiomatic as you know, right. the slavery happened or the Holocaust happened. Right. And so just as those two events are axiomatic, so too is the existence and the pervasiveness of systemic racism today. What do we what do we do with that if you don't believe that systemic racism is an established fact but an opinion subject to scrutiny? Um I you know like I wish I had a good answer. There's no, there's no simple answer. I think the the answer is you just, you know, you, my only answer, and I readily admit it's a very unsatisfying answer, and it's an answer that maybe doesn't even solve the problem. I mean, really, that's a subset. That question is a subset of what do you do when somebody has a really dogmatically held belief, right? There, there's a great article actually by um, uh, uh, he used to go by Scott Alexander, I mean, Scott Siskin, I think. Is his actual actual name? He do, used to do Slate Star Codex. It's now called the Astral Codex. Um, he's a trained as a psychiatrist and is unbelievably good in sort of research methods and philosophy of science. He has um, uh, an essay, a blog titled "The Trapped Prior." So, what a trapped prior refers to is Bayesian reasoning, where you know what a lot of it looks like bias to people is really you know, people using their expectations and beliefs about the world to interpret events in the world. And that's actually reasonably rational. So, uh, um, you know, if you took someone, you know, from some background where there was nothing like, you know, Western style you know, or Eastern style education, there's no education, there isn't world to say, the world is round. And they'd say, well, look, the world looks flat. You can just, the world is obviously flat, right? Because just look at it, it's flat. There's no, where's the roundness? So, so that's the use of a prior, right? It's like the world looks flat. Why should, just because you're telling me the world is round, why should I believe the world is flat? It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, but what a trapped prior is, is a belief or expectation so firmly entrenched that no evidence could change it. So, so 
you know, there's there's a whole issue of of sort of Orwellian use of words. And my personal, that is, words have like these squishy meanings depending on their political usefulness. So white supremacy to me means white people are supreme. That is, so they should be on the top, right, of every metric that you have. So all you need to do is have a couple of metrics where white people are not, and it's, it falsifies this claim of white supremacy. It doesn't say there's no discrimination. It doesn't say there wasn't a bad history. It doesn't, know, but but it, it is certainly evidence inconsistent with claims of white. Now, it doesn't mean you can have white people being near the top, but not the top, and there is discrimination. But now you have a nuanced conversation rather than mm-hmm. America's a white supremacy. And everyone knows it. And you know, you're a racist if you say otherwise. So, so, but for somebody with a trapped prior, this is like, you know, they'll just like impugn the evidence. They'll have reasons not to believe the evidence. So, I mean, so for example, Asians have had a higher family income than white people for, um, for decades. There's a slew of immigrant groups from Africa and the Middle East that have higher incomes than do white people. Um, and so this is just not the behavior of a white supremacy. Um, but it, again, it doesn't mean there is no racial discrimination, but it's, not, it's just not the, the, the uh, what would be produced by a genuine, by an anything, you know, it, what, Fill in the blank supremacy, that group should end up on top. If they don't end up on top, it's probably not a fill in the blank supremacy. Now, if that doesn't affect someone's beliefs, you're probably dealing with somebody with a trap prior. And if they have a trap prior, I, you know, both Siskind and I have no idea what you do with that. His response is you probably need years of therapy. Well, you know, speaking of ther- therapy and speaking to you, Lee, as a psychologist, can you pinpoint um, from a psychological perspective, like when this kind of new dogma started to come in and you know what drove it and what kind of fomented it? I mean, do you have a psychological kind of explanation for what we're seeing? Um. You know, that's like a big, that's a big question, right? Yeah, because what, yeah. You're, what you're asking is sort of about a, a, a cultural shift, at least on the left. You know, I'm not sure that the center or right has changed very much on these things, but certainly they, it's a big cultural shift on the left. Um, and, I, you know, I think, there are probably, I'm now speculating off the cuff, you know, so, um, but in doing that, I would guess that there are several strains of real developments and ideas that sort of came together for this, um, to sort of catalyze um, the left's Adoption of of you know widespread adoption of of you know endorsement of the idea that systemic racism is prevalent in 2022 and America is a white supremacy here now. I mean, we're not talking about 1865; we're talking now. Um, so, okay, so one is you know there were all these the, the major civil rights legislation of the 60s. So this was a major event, a major accomplishment. Overthrows Jim Crow. And, you know, now it's, whatever, 55 years later, and we still have massive inequality and massive racial inequality. And it's not really much less than it was. It might be somewhat less than that, but it's not a lot less than it was then. Um, And so this is a puzzle. This is like a problem, a puzzle and a problem um, that requires answers. That so, and, and I think it's a reasonable conclusion, certainly that, those laws were insufficient to eliminate those inequalities. And that's, how do you reach any conclusion other than that, but then by the other laws and you have massive continued inequality. So there is a problem there. Um, and okay, so, so, so this is a, and so, so you then had multiple synergistic, probably independent efforts in, in empirical psychology, you had a shift towards the study of like subtle, invisible forms of racism like implicit bias. Mm-hmm. Now, in my opinion, the implicit bias areas of wreck. 
there may be a there there, but but the area as it stands is a wreck. Um, but it's widely popular and it's widely believed, and both Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris have referred to it in their campaigns as if it's a real thing. I mean, I think it's a good example of what David, what you were just talking about, is sort of in, along the lines of systemic racism. It's taken for granted that this is a real thing, even though the science is sort of deeply uncertain and actually controversial. Um, but, but it's taken as a thing because it works well as political rhetoric. But, and because it works well as political rhetoric and people, you know, your, your average lefty who is, I don't know, you know, maybe an amateur musician or a cab, a waiter hoping to get a job in a play or working in a tech company, you know, they don't know, they can't, they're not going to do a deep dive on the limitations to research on implicit bias. But, you know, there are lots of, and it's very easy to go on Google Scholar and you put in implicit bias. Oh, look, there's all this peer reviewed science on it. And people I like and respect are saying it's a thing. It must be a thing. Okay, so that, so you have that quest of implicit bias, you have microaggressions, right? You have this whole sort of, you have stereotype threat. You have all these, like, this um, toolbox of subtle, pernicious ways supposedly oh, that racism manifests in everyday life, all of which is based on dubious science. It's not, and when I say dubious, there may still end up being, some of it may end up ultimately being vindicated, there may be some truth to some of it, but it is, it is due, in my opinion, very dubious science. Okay, but it, but it says things people want, so you have that, and that, that's not conventional social science. And then in the 60s and 70s, you had, the rise of, of actual critical race theory. You know, you had um, all, all sorts of you know, scholars, legal scholars, educational scholars, writing about race and racism being deeply embedded in American culture and American systems. And in some ways they were correct. I mean, I some of it, you know, I mean, Nixon, I, 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 there's a, just a great uh, public record of, of Nixon's administration um, uh, uh, um, doing the whole law and order and, and uh, drug crime thing to disrupt black communities because they weren't supporting Republican candidates. So that, that's, that's fact. I, listen, you know, I don't need critical race theory to know that that's a fact because that is an actual historical fact and that should be taught. And that people need to know that actually. So, you know, there's, as a fact, one's ideology or activist agendas are irrelevant to evaluating how true that is. So, because you know, there's just <laughs> historical records for it. And that then it does raise the question, and this is a reasonable question, how many other laws, practices, and policies that maybe are not so obviously historically well-documented as Nixon's use of drug laws, how many other such practices and policies have racist components to them? That's also a completely reasonable question. But yeah, you know, that, that but but making it having it as a reasonable question is very different than you know. I mean, in some cases we do. I was going to say then we know the answer, and the country is filled with systemic racism and white supremacy. Now, sometimes we do know the answer, and when we know the answer, that I'm, we should teach it. We should teach it. We should talk about it. We should acknowledge it. That's just I. You know, my take would be that we know that answer far less frequently than those who make frequent allusions to systemic mm -hmm. racism and white supremacy mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could not agree more. <laughs> right. And and you know it is at the very least these are ideas that can be debated. You could you could in a college classroom or in a high school classroom read Ibram X. Kendi and John McWhorter side by side and say, yeah. okay how do they differ? You know, I, I don't know what you think about this, but, you know, to me, the problem with critical race theory is not that it offers sort of a critical theoretical lens that one can bring to bear in the study of disparity in society. I think that's legitimate. I might not agree with everything Derek Bell ever wrote, but at least as a theoretical lens, and um, I can appreciate um, its its use, its utility, um, but that, but it's only when it's sort of combined with this idea that only people with lived experience get to define the world, and then therefore, we it's insisted on the sort of it's it's fundamental truth that it becomes a problem. Like that's when yeah. it's a problem. Otherwise, it's just one one 
intellectual right. tool in your toolbox. Yeah. Right. And I think that critical race theory, I mean, it's it, it it's not the what, it's the how that it's been applied. Right. I mean, there it does ha- has some quick questions that need to that need to be discussed. It's the how, it's the imposition, it's the nothing else matters. Right. But this right. view that has um made it, I mean, it's watered it down and actually made it so that it doesn't have a real well, I mean, it, it has an impact because we've seen people fighting over it, right? But I mean, <laughs> but it doesn't have the impact that it probably could have as 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 a as a tool. Yeah, I don't know about I I I mean, you know, kind of I, I mean, I think it has had a lot of impact. So, you know, to some extent, I feel a little hamstrung in addressing these kinds of issues because I've only recently concluded that I need to actually be an activist as part of my professional activities. Mm-hmm. My entire career, like I wanted to be a social scientist, where I would just want to find stuff out and figure out what is true and what isn't. And being an activist is different. I mean, I've, I've been an activist. I was an anti-war, anti-Vietnam War activist in the 70s. And I was, um, I lived in a community that kept rejecting local school budgets. My kids were all in the public schools. So I actually formed a group to pass school budgets and build a new school. And we did that. So I've been an activist, but it was separate from my professional career. Um, and about a year and a half ago, that changed for me. That that I saw um, the basic rise of illiberalism throughout the academy. It's like my way or the highway. It's not simply that here are a set of ideas. It's like if you don't buy these ideas, you're a racist and you should be punished and driven out if we can. Um, uh, and this is, you know, that I think that's gotten worse. And so being an activist, you start out with a strategic goal. Well, what do I want? I want to preserve uh, bastions within the academy where you can address controversial and politicized issues without the fear of being punished. Now, you can't guarantee that because there's always outsiders, but at least within some group or organization. So that, that led me to, well, okay, one of the things we need is our own professional organizations where, where that embrace these ideas. So at least you won't be driven out of the organization. We can't guarantee that you'll be protected from your own administrators, although maybe we can do things to help with that also, actually. So, you know, this, you have groups like FIRE and the uh, Academic Freedom Alliance taking very active stands when faculty come under fire again, um, to some positive effect. I mean, I think uh, there have been a number of, you know, it's always hard to really distill cause and effect, but there have been a number of cases where faculty have come under, you know, cancellation mob type attack, outrage mob attack, and either the Academic Freedom Alliance or FIRE have sent letters of concern to the administration, and then they backed off. Now, did they back off because of the public? Ex- you know, I, I, I doubt they're afraid of the organizations. They are probably afraid of the bad public publicity. Um, but and maybe their own trustees, by the way. Yeah, right, right. So I, I think those efforts are doing some good. So that, it's, you know, that's very different than me doing five studies to document the rise of left-wing authoritarianism, right? Mm-hmm. Which I am actually doing things like that. But, but, <laughs> but that's a different kind of activity, that, right? right? So, um, so you're, but the point is to come full circle, you were asking, well, well, maybe, you know, they would have more impact if they would kind of um, engage in alternative ideas, but, they, but, uh, but uh, you know, they, they have captured both, you know, both academia and the mainstream media have been mostly captured by far left activists. Mm-hmm. And, by that, you know, I, you can see this. There, there are analyses of like New York Times and Washington Post and the frequency with which you'll find terms like patriarchy or white supremacy. And those have the, the, the rise in the use of those terms by the media mm-hmm. precede you know, the widespread public adoption mm-hmm. of, of beliefs in the power and prevalence of these things. So you had sort of a cadre of 
intellectuals trained in these things who became journalists and op-ed writers and all this sort of stuff, who now work at the New York Times and the Washington Post and all, all this sort of stuff. And so, you know, so that's, so that's been very successful. I mean, you know, in the, I think it was in the 60s, a German, it was a German far left, I think Marxist, argued that, you know, revolution, the whole, you know, communist revolution thing was not going to work in the West. What, you, what they needed to do was engage in the long march through the institutions. That is, you had to get right, people right. who believed in these far left ideas in positions of power, you know, in deanships and editorial you know, positions and newspapers. You get those people in those positions and then you can instigate, instigate the, you know, the radical change that is deemed necessary. And I don't, you know, I don't think this was, I don't think there was like some, you know, Politburo like organization sitting around scheming to do this, you know, so I don't think there's like a conspiracy, but I do think that that is largely what's happened. And, and a lot of the institutions have been captured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's happening. That, that's been very successful. It's hard to say that, you know, they would have more impact if they did it differently. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to imagine them having much more impact than they've had already. Right. No, it's in many ways, it's a it's a it's a brilliant multifaceted strategy. If you look at how this ideology spreads and how it's sort of commandeered the language, for example, how it uses language and it actually makes it hard to discuss because it it, right. it claims a monopoly over the language itself. You you yeah. you have to almost marvel in its genius. Right. Uh, you know, at um, you know that 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 they were able, whoever they is, were able to pull this off in the way that they did. Yes. Um, so you know, we're going to have to be just as smart as they are to sort of reverse some of the damage. You know, one of the, I guess one question I I know we're running out of time here. One question I have is um, is on the one hand, it seems like maybe the political environment around this is beginning to thaw. Right. That that, you know, you had the backlash in Virginia and you're seeing other signs that there is a mounting challenge to this ideology. On the other, it seems to me that this ideology, especially since George Floyd, has been deeply institutionalized in many places. Yeah. That's much harder to sort of unearth than um, yeah. than sort of just a change in political winds. Do you, what, what is your feeling on that? Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, certainly within academia, you know, I mean, like, right, you, you, there is a direct line from, you know, George Floyd's horrendous murder, which was horrendous and, you know, evoked outrage that was, you know, appropriate for the situation. Um, and the institutions, uh, the institution of, diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracies throughout academia. Now, you know, a white cop killing a black guy has no obvious connection to DEI in academia. Other than now, you know, if you want, the, I guess the argument would be systemic racism, and we need to combat systemic racism everywhere. And, and the way to do that is by installing a multi-million dollar bureaucracy uh, to advance DEI at our university. I guess that's the sort of the sort of logic of it. Um, uh, but they are instituted. Um, it's really, you know, uh, more and more common. Um, and once you have um, a bureaucracy, a bureaucratic organization within something like a university or large corporation, bureaucracies take on lives of their own and they don't get approved. I mean, that's just, you know, it's going to be there forever. And so one of the best, I, so, so one of, probably one of the best and most underutilized contenders for a tool to, and I'm not, I'm not even sure I want to combat DEI policy. It depends on the DEI policy, right? It's, it's my concern about DEI policies are when they overflow into a liberalism and they threaten academic freedom, um, I have a slide in my this talk I was just referring to about the radicalization of academia. You know, the rhetoric is all about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and the effect has been 
to exclude 90, 80% of Americans. And what I mean by that is the, you know, the goal is laudable as to, uh, and I could, I could get on board with the goal, depending on how it's being implemented, of having academics, professors more closely uh, represent or correspond to a, to a demographic um, representation of the population. I could get on board with that. It's at the expense of, of excluding um, anyone, you know, to the right of a you know, mainstream Democrat. And so given, so, you know, for mainstream Democrat, you know, half the Democrats are more left than that. Half the Democrats are somewhat right of that. Um, this is a tiny proportion of the population. This is like 15, 20% of the population um, is being included in academia and the other 80 to 90% is being excluded. That's a very Orwellian definition or understanding of what inclusion is. If they were serious about inclusion, they would be working at making sure that, you know, these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Work towards a more demographically uh, representative mix, but obviously you have a political problem as well. Um, so. It's been uh, fascinating and it's always <laughs> interesting to talk to you because you bring this sort of academic rigor to the conversation and this familiarity with social science that I think enriches us collectively in our ability to sort of stand up for liberal values and intellectual integrity. So I, I not, not only do I appreciate this conversation, but I appreciate the role you play in helping the rest of us put our best foot forward in this very trying time. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I really appreciate you saying that. I, the, the, you know, the, 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 for me, there is a core principle that helps cut through a lot of the nonsense. And that is, as much as possible, however imperfectly we all do it, make a genuine effort to cleave to the truth, to figure out what the truth is and, and, and reveal it. Um, and, and, you know, I, I recently, there was some philosopher recently tweeted, destroy by truth. And I just retweeted it. It was like, yeah. I mean, I, I'm completely, you know, this is like a common thing as well. You know, don't say anything unless you have something constructive to say. The destructive criticism, I disagree with all that. I completely just, I've always disagreed with that. If something's really wrong, you don't even need to know what's right. You can just say that's wrong. So like, you don't need to know how well the Pfizer vax works to know that the evidence against what ivermectin is, is, is strong, like that ivermectin does not work. That's it. You don't need to know what does work, right? So, this yeah. is, and there are a million things like this. Like, actually, it's like diversity and implicit bias training programs. They don't do anything. They accomplish nothing. I mean, other. Right. I mean, who knows? Let me put it this way: the evidence produced so far has failed to produce uh, them any uh, any evidence of them accomplishing much of anything good. Let's put it that way. Now, maybe maybe they haven't studied it in the right way. I actually suspect that one effect of those uh, programs is to do is to induce ideological conformity in the organization because people are, you know, getting the message correctly that the higher ups want us to say the kind of things and to act like we believe the kind of things in these trainings. So that is an effect, and then you could argue whether that's a good effect or not. And I, I you know, I tend to be on the side of if you're inducing ideological conformity, that's kind of a bad thing. And it doesn't really matter which ideology. It's not that the you know the ideology is good or bad, but people, a society where people feel more rather than less free to tell you what they really think is a better society, even if what they really think is something you don't want to hear. I agree more. Thank you very much. To be continued for sure. <laughs> okay. That's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hold My Drink. Like or subscribe to the show and check out the show notes for links to source material and to our website where you can find what each of us is reading every week. Different news with different views. If you have a topic that you would like us to explore, drop us a line. And join us next week as we say hold my drink and the conversation gets real.